One of the things we're going to be doing at the end of this month is we're going to be having a tent meeting, Freedom Field. That's going to be October 1, 2, 3, and 4. We're setting up the tent. This is not a unity service uh, meeting. This will be Genesis. I have my own speakers that are going to be coming in and r right out of this church are going to be speaking in that in the evenings. Uh, of course, our worship team will be there, but we'll go Thursday through Sunday and we're going to reach out to this community and just see what God will do. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to real breakthrough, the very thing that was spoke here this morning and prophesied and that you saw demonstrated uh, things that they experienced over in Bedford in that tent meeting we're expecting here. And during this season, this time, you know, a lot of mm, uh, individuals aren't willing to step out and do anything in the city. And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to meet, do more. Now, uh, this is something that God had laid on my heart. Uh, I really felt it almost like it came in a dream. And um, so I'm going to follow through on it and see what the Lord will do. And uh, uh, I just want you to begin to pray. Church, pray for this. Pray for this tent meeting coming at the end of September, the 1st of October. Pray for it. Let's believe God to do things that are beyond the normal. Let's believe for the supernatural. Hey, I love Acts chapter 4 where we're believing the Lord. They're praying, you know, that the Lord God would stretch forth his hand to heal. And that signs and wonders might be done in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to believe for. Not just to put on a show, but to see lives changed. To see this city changed. Hallelujah. Amen. So... I'll have more information about that as we go along. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. You know, this, uh, this meeting we're looking at, I, I want you to pray a couple of things here. You can just kind of jot down if you want to keep them stick in your heart to pray about. Number one, pray for good weather. Right. Pray for weather just like this out right. here. Right. Beautiful weather. Amen. Just pray for that. Believe our God will give us that kind of weather. I, over the years, we've prayed for weather Amen. many times, and the Lord answers our prayer. Uh, I wanted to mow grass one time. As small as that, insignificant as that, I wanted to mow my yard, you know, because it was already high and, they were, and rain was coming. You know, I looked at the radar, here it's come. And I said, Lord, just delay that. And it's like that thing went, Err! I mowed my grass and then boom, yeah. here it came. Yeah. Ah, yeah, I know that sounds weird, but that just sounds normal to me. Okay, anyway, uh, Cindy. Kids, you are dismissed. Yay. Praise the Lord. Love it. This field where we do Freedom Field, where we will set up the tent, is surrounded by apartments. And there are many, many, many Latinos that live in these apartments. And what we're looking to do uh, is to contact one of the leading pastors among the Latinos and to have them come in on this meeting. Oh, come on. Come on, saints. Come on. Come on. You might have grew, grown up in white America. I don't know. But, but we got we to gotta see people of other color and, and uh, uh, ethnicity and all of this kind of thing if we're going to reach them. Because before the throne of God, Revelation chapter 4, every tribe, tongue, people, and nation is going to stand before the Most High God. And, and I'm just believing I'm going to be one of those dots out there in that vast crowd who will behold the living God and will worship him. Can you see it? Hallelujah. So it's good stuff. It's really, really good stuff that God is calling us to. And, and uh, you know, what, what, what you want to understand is that the Lord is really doing something in Genesis. You know, uh, I want you to understand I, I'm not out to be a one-man show. You're going to notice, you know, I want to push other people forward. And, and you really have to be, number one, dead to self. You have to deal with your pride, your own self-agenda. Because if you're not pushing other people forward, then they're not going to grow. They're not going to change. They're not going to develop. And the beautiful thing is, is God wants, he's raising up spiritual fathers. I'm one. Raising up spiritual mothers to push others forward where they don't think they have to run the whole show. And so God is, is adjusting. He's changing things because the church is changing. Mike Bickle, a friend of mine whom I've had in my church back in the past, uh, was in Egypt. And he was, uh, had been spending 
um, day after day uh, upon his face and fasting and prayer. I forget. I don't know if it was a 40 day or not. But, but anyway, the vo audible voice of the Lord came to him as he was laying in a hotel room in Egypt and uh, spoke to him. And he said, son, in one generation, I will change the face of my church. In one generation, yes. I will change the face of my church. And while church is, it has developed in America into a building, and you go to a building, the Lord God is adjusting that, and he's used the COVID thing, because what has forced people to do is to slow down as he shut the world down, shut sports down, all the gods all right. that people in America worship, just think about it, sports gods, Amen. entertainment gods, shuts it all down. And then if they're listening to the Spirit, instead of wasting that time, they sought the Lord. <coughs> they sought the Lord to hear His voice clear, to go deeper, to know Him more. And so God is doing something. He's changing the face of the church. Right now it's going on. Right. He's changing it. Yes. You know, we, we can't have a building mentality I mean, I have a vision to build a building on that freedom field. But I don't know if that's what the Lord is going to do or not. I keep praying about it. I'm not asking, you know, I'm not having a vision. I say, Lord, come and put your stamp on my vision. I'm saying, Lord, what is your vision? And I'll come and put my stamp on your vision. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is where, you know, this is where, you know, the rubber meets the road. You, you experience these changes in this way. Well, last time, remember, we were talking about discipleship, and I'm going to take you there again this morning, Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 14, because discipleship is different. Discipleship is different than this church membership. It's different than uh, being a fan of Jesus. I am not a fan of Jesus. I know it always shocks people when you first say that. And here's why, because I am his disciple. You know how fans can be. Team is good. Yay. Team is bad. Yeah. <laughs> but for me, I'm a disciple of Jesus. When things are good, yay, Jesus. Things aren't so good, yay, Jesus. That's the difference between a fan and a disciple of Jesus Christ or a nominal Christian. Somebody just shows up. Good morning, Michael Spina. We love you, man. You're healed in Jesus' name. Glory to God, you're healed. Michael, matter of fact, Michael Spina just got healed of cancer. I could have Michael give his own testimony. I'm going to give it for you. That'd be all right. Had cancer on his head, diagnosed. It was bad. Jesus healed him. Amen. There he sits. He's totally free from it. Totally free from it. And the rest of it's going to happen too. Total restoration. Anyway. God is, is, is wanting us to get a hold of this. He's wanting us to experience something we've never experienced before. Okay, let's go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 this morning. Amen. We'll start there. And, and this is important because discipleship, it really is different than uh, church membership or being a fan of Jesus. Uh, the, the thing you have to understand is when you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have sold out. You have sold out. And if you don't sell out, if you do not sell out, then eventually you will sell out. You will quit. You'll back away. This is my 50th year in Christianity, 50th year in ministry, 50th year, well, not quite 50 years in ministry, but close. And over the years, you know, I've had people who have hung in there and 50 years later, they're still loving Jesus. Others, you can't find them anymore. But you got to sell out or you'll sell out. Yeah. Right. And Jesus loves us so much, he wants us to sell out yeah. from the very start. The Lord Jesus doesn't want us to have any illusions, any delusions about what it means to follow him, to take up our cross and follow him. And this is really important. He loves us that much. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I mean, think about it. He, he loves us so much, he tells us right up front, Brother, sister, my son, my daughter, here's what it's going to cost you. I'm always amazed at the Apostle Paul. 
You know, he gets saved on the Damascus Road, believes in the Lord, and then uh, the Lord appears to Ananias, the old man, remember, and sends him to pray for Paul so that Paul can be healed and receive his eyesight. And Ananias is, is, is kind of, you know, arguing with the Lord. He, the Lord, I, I've heard by many about this guy. He, 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 what he did in Jerusalem to your people, and he's come here to do the same kind of stuff. And the Lord just said, go, because he is my chosen vessel, and I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Uh, you know, you tell that to the average religious person today, Jesus loves you. He's got a plan for you. But here is what you're going to suffer for my name's sake. Yeah. And by and by, it's Jeez. goodbye. <laughs> Discipleship is different. Discipleship is where you make a commitment. And regardless of what you go through, regardless of what you experience, you hold on to him. And as the years go by and the months go by, you hold on to him ever tighter. You're, you're ever closer to him. You, you develop this relationship with him. You know, it's not like, and of course, we've all experienced this, especially here in America, where, so where somebody's approached you with something, a business, a company, uh, some individual, and, and they are saying, you, you come follow me, and this is, we're going to give you this, and we're going to give you this, and you're going to get that discount, and you're, you're going to get that, and you're going to get that. And, and, and once they've hooked you and they're reeling you in, oh, by the way, yeah. Uh, you're going to have to pay this fee and there'll be this number of hours you'll have to put into this. And how many have ever gone through anything like that in America? You all, have, all of you put your hands up. You all know about that. You know, they, they promise you all this stuff and they make it so rosy, but they don't tell you about the other things. Well, Jesus is not like that. Our Lord Jesus is so sincere, so honest, in presenting himself, he wanted his people to know. And remember last week, I was sharing with you about, you know, the me first disciples, the, the impetuous disciple. Here in Luke chapter 9, you just, all you have to do is read these scriptures and, and uh, it's, you're different. <laughs> you're a different kind of church. If you just read these scriptures in the average church, you're different. Uh, because listen, now, now it happened, verse 57, as they journeyed on the road, that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And, and remember how I presented to you last week that no doubt this disciple had seen Jesus raise the dead and heal the sick and cast out the demons and feel the multitude. And, and you, know, you know, these impetuous disciples, you know, that, you know what it is to be impetuous. It just means to rush headlong into something without thinking it through. And they just, he just, you know, they see that, oh, man, I'm going to follow you. You know, you know, you, you can feed a crowd like that or, or, or you, you cast those demons out and they're set free or you raise those two people from the dead. Man, I'll follow you, Lord. And the Lord right away says, brother, brother, listen, foxes have their holes and birds of the air have their nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Have you ever wondered about that? Yeah. This is the Son of God who created the heavens and the earth. He's just letting him know that unlike the foxes and the birds, there's uncertainty. You don't know what the future holds. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Well, you don't, you, you tell me, okay, tell me what the future holds. Any volunteers? Okay. I, I'm not trying to be smart aleck with you. I'm, I'm trying to point out that the Lord Jesus is telling this guy, you follow me and life is not going to be a bowl of cherries. Uh, you, you're, not, you're not just going to go through life without tests or trials or, or a devil trying to destroy you. Right. Uh, or even the world trying to destroy you and always pulling at you, come follow us. Come follow us. You're not going to go through that. And the Lord Jesus is so honest, so sincere. And this is one of the great things in uh, the Lord is changing about the church, their sincerity. They have no ulterior motives. 
They're not saying one thing and thinking something else. They're not doing one thing and hoping they can get a buck off of you. They're, you see, the church is changing. The men and women that God is raising up in this hour, a part of Joel's army, a part of this glorious bride, are absolutely sincere. They're sincere. They're true. They're honest. They've laid it down their self-agendas, and they've taken up his. And you see, this is what's coming out here about this, well, the impetuous disciple. Let, let, me, let me show you. Let me show you. Uh, Mark, go to, go to the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark. And I want you to go, let me find it here. I know I wrote it down. I don't have to write it down. Mark 10. Mark chapter 10. Now, this, this is going to help you. This will really help you, saints. Because here we are again. You know, Jesus is on the road. Jesus on the road. So much happened to Jesus when he's on the road. Listen, okay, let's begin reading here. Jesus on the road, verse 17. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Man, he's got the right question. You know, he's not asking, Lord, what can I do to get my business going? Uh, what can I do to get a wife? Uh, what can I do, you know, uh, to get a new job? N none of that stuff. No, no. What can I do, Lord, to get eternal life? Not temporary life like this life. Life forever in the presence of God. And, uh, and well, the Lord answers him. He said, well, first of all, he answers him out of his humanity. I like this. So, you know, our, we've got a humble God. Jesus is very humble. Matter of fact, you should emulate him. He said, I'm meek and lowly in heart. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. We got a humble God. He says, why do you call me good? Now, good. He's answering him out of his humanity here. No one is good but one, and that is God. Of course, he means his father. You know the commandments. He's talking to this young man, a Jew, a Jewish man who's been brought up in the law. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not be a liar, bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said, Jesus, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Now that's, that's, that's tremendous. I mean, it really is tremendous testimony and then jesus looking at him and beloved there's more than just that he just looked at him he's looking into him jesus is looking into him and here's how i know jesus looking at him loved him and said one thing you lack go sell Whatever you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come. Take up the cross and follow me. See, Jesus looked at this young man, and the very first thing we're told is he loved him. You look up the Greek term, it's the term you're, most of you are familiar with, agape or agapao, the noun. It's that term, that unconditional, he loved him. And he loved him so much, he said, here's the one thing that's going to be a snare to your soul. Here's the one thing that will keep you out of eternal life. Your covetous. Your mature possessions mean more to you than the living God or eternal life. Now, I, I, people, folk, there, there are a lot of folk in the church they're, they're, they're under some kind of delusion that they're going to meet Jesus and, hey, 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 Lord, you know, and the Lord is going to look right into them. And listen, I'm talking about myself in the sense of he's going to look right into me. And what I want him to see is the truth. No pretense. I don't have any agenda. I'm as sincere and as truthful as I can be. I'm not trying to impress anybody, not trying to be a big shot. I just want to serve him 
because I know if he tarries another 30, 40 years, I may not be here. And I may be, may be thinking about retirement. You laugh, but you go ahead and keep laughing. So anyway, uh, that's right, I got plans. 2022, Cindy and I will experience our 50th wedding anniversary. Wow. And we turn 70. Yeah. And I've been doing this for 50 years. Joe, how long did you drive a truck? 40, 50 years? Uh, yeah. Yeah. 40, 50 years. Anybody else in here retired? <laughs> John, you're retired. But you still work out of your workshop. He still he built a beautiful, uh, what was it, medallion box? What was that? Oh, challenge coin box. Challenge coin box. Beautiful. He he's a wor woodworker. Yeah. If you need any woodwork, I don't know if you're looking for any jobs, but <laughs> he's retired. <laughs> and David, he retired from the military. You know, after twenty, twenty two years. Praise the Lord. And folk, you know, people say, oh, pastor, you can't retire. You just refire. Well, I may refire, but not like you might think. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it gets quiet when you talk like these things. Oh, I, this wasn't even a part of the message this morning. I, I'm already, already letting out stuff. <laughs> Glory. You want to know why I'm raising up the younger ones, the other, pushing people forward? The very same reason that the priests in the Old Testament, they started at age 20, and when they hit the age of 50, they had to retire. And then they went into a teaching mold. The priests just didn't quit, but they had their farms and their businesses and so forth. And but they also taught the Word of God. There's things you got to think about. I'm glad Cindy and I, we sat down a number of years ago and we started thinking about these things. But you notice here, the one thing that's going to keep this guy out, and the Lord Jesus loves him, and this, listen, this is the Savior talking to him. The one who's going to save his soul by his blood in the not too distant future by going to the cross. But he's telling him, if you don't give this up, It'll be a snare to your soul. One thing, one thing, one thing. You see, it all depends on who's your one thing. Yeah. Psalm 27, verse 4, I've been studying it, meditating on it. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. One thing. What's your one thing? What's your one thing? Is God your one thing? Is Jesus your one thing? Go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, take up your cross, follow me. But he was sad, verse 22. He was sad. That, that prophetic word, you know, people always want to get prophetic words. And here Jesus gave him a prophetic word. Yeah. Here's what will hang you up, keep you out of heaven and hang the, heaven, headed to hell. Yeah. This one thing. And he was sad and went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. He not only had great possessions, great possessions had him. That's why I keep, you know, we preach it, we preach it here, and you hear any true church, you're going to hear, learn to be generous. Don't, don't, don't have this kind of a hand. Have that kind of a hand. Right. And believe God to make you a benefactor instead of a, a consumer. Right. Always consuming, consuming, give me, give me, give me, give me. You know, change, let God change your heart. We're here. Here, how can I help you? Yeah. How can I help you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Glory to God. So, he's sorrowful. He goes away. And, and, you know, Jesus being a man, and we've all done this, and, you know, you, you've said something, you've shared something most precious or 
pretty, pretty profound, and, and they turn you down. And it's kind of like, uh, um, and you just kind of look at your buddy, you know. Look what Jesus did here. And, and Jesus just kind of looked around at his disciples. Notice what they are. How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Can you have riches and still enter the kingdom? Let's find out. Let's see. And the disciples, verse 24, were astonished at his words. I mean, they're taken back. They're thinking, no, nobody's going to make it then, Lord. Nobody. And the disciples were astonished, but Jesus answered again. And he didn't even give them any time to process. He just comes right. He said, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. And then that scripture that everybody uses, and they don't know, really know what it, they always misuse it. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished. <laughs> you know, they're not just astonished, they're greatly astonished. And, say, and they're saying, there, there's no one, verse, there's no one who, who can be saved. And Jesus looked at them and said, with men it's impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible, yeah. even people with possessions to be saved. Because they got the one thing right. They got the one thing right. I told you how the Lord told me, you know, I helped my father-in-law build a house. Beautiful place there. It was just down, not too far away from the home that he had built. He was a master carpenter. He built from foundation. He did the plumbing. He, he did it all. He, he Best carpenter I ever worked for was around. And I helped him for a number of months build this house. And one day he turned to me, he said, Jeff, if you'll live here for five years and give me $300 a month, I'll turn it over to you. I took him up on the deal. I helped him build it, started paying $300 a month, nothing for this beautiful home. 300 had a fireplace. I mean, it was up in this wooded area. Oh, glory. Five years. Two years in. The word of the Lord comes to me. Move to Indianapolis. And see, there were things going on in Indianapolis. I had meetings going on. I uh, had a church. It wasn't a church. It was developing into a church. But we had two to 300 people coming. Started in a house with a, like four or five people. John, uh, before it was over with, we had 160 people packed into this house in a residential area. I mean, they were sitting in the bathrooms and <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> and, and we had to move out of there because it kept growing. And then it went to 200 and it went to 300. We kept getting build, bigger places. Finally, we built a place debt free and uh, had a congregation of four or 500 people there. But the Lord said, move so you can shepherd them. I remember the day I went to my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, and I said, and I was dreading it. I said, you know, little, because my father-in-law wasn't a Christian. Greatest, he'd give you the shirt off his back. Great man. Six months before he dies at the age of 77, he gives his heart to the Lord Jesus. But at that time, he wasn't saved. And he loved his grandchildren, and he loved his daughter, living just stone's throw away. And I went to him and said, we're moving to Indianapolis. I remember he just looked at me and dropped his head and walked away. Easy. I don't remember seeing that here. <laughs> yeah. But, but Saint, let, let's, let's be real about our Christianity. If the Lord asks something of you, are you or aren't you going to do? You have the one thing. Yeah, right. and, and, and this is the beautiful thing. Now, don't go out and quit your job. Don't go out and sell your house tomorrow. Stop that nonsense. Man, I picked that up in the spirit. All, you preach a message like that, and people, oh, I'm, I'm not following Jesus. Yes, you are. Yeah. Right. God's just taking you deeper is all. Right. Yeah. Anyway. 
best thing I ever did. Because this is what, look what Jesus says here. Look, look. Jesus said this. Verse 27, he looked at him. Man, Peter began, and I like this. Because, you know, this is, a, this is an interaction going on. Peter began to say to Jesus. Notice, notice the wording. He began to say, and the Lord cuts, this is the beautiful thing. The Lord just cuts him off. You ever cut anybody off? They start to say something. No, no, no. No, I'm just, and you just break in and you cut them off. And the Lord just broke in on Peter and he, and he cut him off. And, and because Peter said this, see, we've left all and followed you. And, and, and Jesus, right in the middle of Peter saying all that and everything else Peter was going to say about it, you know, Jesus answered, said, assuredly, assuredly, this is God saying this, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who's left the house, brothers, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, lands with persecutions. Don't leave that out. I remember hearing a preacher, he would always leave that out when he'd preach on this text. With persecutions. And then look at this, in the age to come, eternal life. And Jesus is talking about two different time periods, now and forever. And he said, if you'll do this now, you'll have houses and lands and brothers and sisters. He, notice it doesn't say wife again. You only got one of the uh, but mothers. I, I want to tell you over the last 50 years, I've had spiritual fathers and mothers. I've had lands. Um, I've, I've, I've had houses. And think of me with 10 kids. But, you know, we would get the most beautiful houses. We'd present our case to them, and they'd let us come in where they wouldn't let anybody else come in with our 10 kids. Houses and lands and brothers and sisters with persecutions. <laughs> I've had some of that too. And I'm looking forward to living forever in the presence of God. Man, I'm in a win-win, folks. I'm in a win-win. Oh... But many who are first will be last, and uh, the last are going to be first. So a lot of people who, you know, are trusting in themselves, this and that, uh, they're in for a surprise. The, the thing I want you to see is, look, here's this very thing. Here's the impetuous disciple comes running to Jesus. He's heard all about him. He knows he's got the answers Jesus tells him, here's the one thing. And this is the thing that God is wanting to do in this hour with his people. He wants to tell you the one thing that might be a hang up to you. And then you overcome that. You change. You repent of that. You, you move on. And then, and then he'll show you another thing down the road. Because what happens is you keep growing. You keep maturing. You don't stay a baby. You don't stay a baby. Like, you know, uh, just recently, uh, well, w w Brother Branham, he, he, he tried to explain his gift, and the Lord rebuked him. I mean, the angel of the Lord stood there and rebuked him face to face, said, you're trying to explain my gifting to baby Pentecostals who know very little about the Spirit, and you're trying to explain this gift. Jeremiah Johnson, uh, another prophet, just recently had a vision, a dream. The Lord rebuked him yes. because you're trying to explain things to these people and they're nothing but babies. Right. No, God wants us to grow up. See, th this is the thing, grow up and mature. And, and so, so this is why it, it's so significant. And Jesus, here's, an, here's a biblical example of the Lord Jesus, you know, mano and a mano, you know, man to man. He's got this young guy standing before him. The Lord looks at him and loves him just like he loves you. And he said, well, here, here's what you lack. Come follow me and get that hook off your soul called covetousness. So, so you know, I, I love the Lord. I, I, I'm so thankful. He's so honest that, that the Lord Jesus is so sincere when he calls his disciples. He's, he's not promising us, uh, you know, 
a bed of roses throughout our life. He's telling us there's going to be tests, there's going to be trials, there's going to be things you're going to go through, but I will prove myself faithful. I will show you how much I love you. I will keep you and those you love if you will trust me. If you will lean on me, I'll bring you through. And I can testify he has always brought me through. Right. The, the love that he wants you to give, beloved, uh, to him, in effect, uh, is so strong and so powerful that your love for your loved ones looks like hate. For anybody else and anything else, it, in comparison, it, it looks like hate. And see, that's, that's Luke chapter 14. See, remember I read that one to you too. It goes, Luke, Luke has a lot to say, you know. But Luke chapter 14, he talks about the love. And, and, and you have to understand, beloved, listen, these disciples, the impetuous disciple, the me first disciples, let me go home and bury my father. Uh, let me go home and say farewell. You know, always these people always got their excuses why they can't follow the Lord. They won't commit to him. And they always got these excuses. And, and the Lord Jesus is telling them, you know, it says, you remember Lot's wife? Remember Lot's wife? She put her hand to the plow. Jesus tells us one disciple there in Luke 9, put your hand to the plow. Don't be looking back. Don't be going back. Don't be playing games. You put your hand to the plow, plow. It's not always going to be easy soil. Plow, plow, plow. Get out there and plow, plow. I've had prophets tell me you're going through, and they didn't know me except I was first time ever in one of their meetings. Said, you're going through a hard time, and I was going through an exceedingly hard time. And the ground was exceedingly hard. He said, but you're going to break through. And you know exactly as he prophesied three years later in this church, we broke through. And man, I mean, everything changed in that church. The congregation exploded. Uh, We went from a youth group of 12 kids to 90. Boom. But will you keep plowing? Don't be like Lot's wife. You say, what's with Lot's wife? Remember, she looked back towards Sodom. God is trying to get his church out of Sodom. Not go along with Sodom. Trying to get his church out of Sodom. Don't be looking back. You say, what's the big deal about her looking back? Well, she thought she had escaped the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah because she had left the city. But see, her heart had never left the city. Her heart had never left Sodom. She longed for the sexual perversion and license and freedom that was found in Sodom. Just like that. She becomes a pillar of salt. I believe it literally. Uh I've been been there. I've been to the Dead Sea. I've seen the salt pillars. There are thousands of them. Some of you, you go to Israel sometime, you want to make sure you make your trip down to the Dead Sea. And all all the salt in the salt pillars. I went went swimming in the Dead Sea. The salt is so thick, you can't sink. I just kind of rolled over on my side and put my hand like this. And they took a photo of me laying on top of the water. You can't sink. You can sit in the Dead Sea and read a newspaper. The salt is so thick. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these salt pillars. And the thing about her is she was leaving against her will. And something else I want to say to you is they are being led out of there by two angels. And Lot and his wife and his daughters know it's two angels. And she still looks back. God is wanting you to change your heart. Discipleship is different. In Luke chapter 14, I'll just quickly just touch on this. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get to it. But uh, in Luke chapter 14, uh, it's something that God wants us to embrace. He wants us to see. Uh, Because your, your love for him, your love for him compared to your love for everybody else, would look like hate for them. Jesus here in in Luke chapter 14, you know, and it's interesting, Luke, you know, the gospel writer Luke, 
brings all this out. But uh, beginning in verse 25, great multitudes went with him, and Jesus turned and said to them, you know, people sometimes say, oh, that's just for the twelve. That's just for the apostles, you know, that's just for the word ministry. You know, we're, we're just a church member. We're, we're not required. Well, Jesus here turns and looks at that vast multitude, all those people out there following him because they've been seeing the miracles and gotten their belly filled, you know, and all these different things. And, and he turns to them and he says, if anyone, you know, he had to raise his voice, if anyone, comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's the same Jesus that very lovingly and sweetly says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. But you see, this, this, this is God we're talking about, folks. We live on this earth, and we're, oh, we're so limited by what we experience. You know, our experience, we've always lived with sinners and sin. We've been one. If you're born again this morning, you're not anymore. But we grew up in that. We've lived in this. You know, we see it all around us. The injustices and the hatred, the perversions. And we've grown up so when the living God comes here in human form and says, this is what you must do and be if you're going to enter my kingdom. Lots of kingdoms out here you can be a part of and still beat your wife. But if you're going to be a part of my kingdom... No, that won't go on any longer. And this is what the Lord is wanting us to see, and that your love for him. Jesus, you understand, he's not wanting you to hate your wife, hate your mother and father. But your love for them in comparison to your love for him would seem like hate. My dad brought me and my brother up to be athletes, and that's what we became. And my brother was a great athlete, and I did pretty good too. And the day I went to my dad, uh, the night before, I had spent it on prayer, and I literally sweat. I didn't sweat, sweat drops of blood, but I was crying, and I sweat because I had given up. I hadn't told my parents but I'd walked away from Indiana University, my athletic scholarship, my invitation to the NFL, my starting role on the football team, and my degree. I just had one year left. Because the Lord had spoke to me in May of 1973. He said, come out now or forget the end time move of God. Well, folks, I want to be a part of it because it's coming on the earth. And I remember going down to the coach and telling him, and, and then I went home, and, and I had to face my dad the next morning. Listen, I love Jesus more. I love my dad. I love my mom. They were so proud of me. I was the first boy out of our little town in northern Indiana ever made it big, you know, in the sense of, you know, athlete and all pro and all that kind of stuff, you know. And I'm just walking away from it to follow Jesus. And I, I remember walk, going into the living room, and they're sitting there. Dad's in his big chair, and Mom's over by the fireplace. And, and uh, I remember I go in and said, Mom, Dad, I got something to tell you. I said, you, you know, I'm a Christian, and I have a call uh, from the Lord to follow him and be his minister. I said, said I have dropped out of school. And it was quiet just like this. And then my mother began to weep. Oh, Mom. Her birthday is this next Sunday, the 6th. Or Saturday, I guess it would be. No. Anyway, September 6th. She'll be 91 in heaven. She's in heaven. Anyway, she began to cry. And my dad, 
the Lord was so good to me because my dad just dropped the paper and he looked at me and he said, because they'd become Christians over the years that I had been delaying on this. My dad said, well, son, you, and he knew very little, you just need to go do what the Lord wants you to do. Yeah, that's right, Maggie. Yeah. I just said, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. My dad just let it go. But my love for the Lord Jesus Christ in comparison to my love for my mom and dad is greater. And I don't apologize for it. You see, being a disciple of Jesus Christ is different than just being a church member. Just being a fan of Jesus. Just being that impetuous disciple. Whoa, let's go to the next tent revival. Let's see what else is happening. And I love tent revivals. We're going to have one. But you know, some people, they just go to, whoa, let's see what's going to happen. And then their lives never change. I'm unloading the whole barrel here this morning. Glory to God. <laughs> and their lives never change. I'm doing a study right now. I'm going to close with this, I promise you. On the beauty of God. I think I was telling, was I telling you send that, said Cindy? No. Who did I tell that to? I was doing a study on the beauty of God. Mona. She's not in here. She's helping with the kids. <laughs> Mona, thank you for your testimony. Love you. All right. But I'm doing a study on the beauty of God because I, I, more than ever, I want to worship in the beauty of holiness. I want to worship my God in the beauty of holiness. So I'm doing this study on the beauty of God. Remember 27, Psalm 27, verse 4? One thing I've desired, this I will seek after, dwell in the house and behold the beauty of the Lord. I want to behold the beauty of the Lord. He's beautiful. Jesus is so beautiful. And, and you know, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not a f f sissy thing or anything else. Our God, who created all this beauty out here, which is in a fallen state, and we still marvel at it, the creator of beauty is himself beautiful. And when you see him, when you see him, you'll see. You'll see. I can only imagine. <laughs> I can only imagine what that day will bring. Do, 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 do. Da, 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 da. I can only imagine. Woo! So let me wrap this up. Jesus wants us to know what it means to, to follow him. Great multitudes, if anyone comes, does not bear his cross. For which of you intending to build a tower? And see, the Lord is so honest. He wants us to know. It, which of you intending to build a tower, a house, a barn, does not sit down first? Count the cost, whether you got enough to finish it. Lest after you've started, you're not able to finish. And everybody says, <laughs> look at that foundation over there. <laughs> they put that in four years ago. It's still not done. Yeah. Bringing it right into reality, folks. Jesus, I love the Lord. The Lord, his examples are always down to earth and real to life. Yes. You know, begin to mock him. They say, this man began to build, not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to beat him that's coming against him with 20,000. And while the other is still a great way off, signs a pledge of peace. Uh, you know, I think, well, let's have peace. Yeah. I've only got 10, you got 20. Let's have peace. Let me think through this thing again. I might have been a bit rash and hasty and challenging you to this fight. You know, I think, I'll, uh, oh, great king, I think I'll just humble myself and, and let's make conditions of peace. And the Lord Jesus is using that example because uh, men have done that very thing. 
So likewise, verse 33, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. So salt's good. But if the salt's lost its flavor, who's going to make it salty again? And you know, with bad salt, and you know this, you, you can't put that on good ground. You know, that's the last verse. It's neither fit for land nor the dunghill. You can't even put it on a compost pile. But men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So God is, is calling us in this hour to follow him with all of our heart, all of our mind. When the Lord gave me this assignment, and he, he did, he told me, I want you to teach on these two passages because they've been a long time. I don't even know if I've ever really touched on them heavy. Uh, I thought, mm, Lord, because uh, you preach these kind of things and people think, oh, you don't like me. No, I do love you. I love you so much. I'm like Jesus. One thing you lack. And you need to deal with it. And, and, and this is something for all of us, not just me. But, but I'm a disciple, folks. I, I'm not a churchgoer. I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, and you know what it means to be a disciple, right? You're, it means you're a student. You follow their teachings and you follow them. So I, I, I'm not just doing this, you know, to make a buck. No. <laughs> Man, Lord God, I'd stop that 50 years ago. <laughs> you know, when I first started my ministry, this will be good for some. When I first started my ministry, I had this little house church. You know, I prayed and prayed and fasted, you know, like 10 to 14 hours a day for I forget how long. And the Lord had called me to quit my job. Now, don't you go out and quit your jobs. Because you don't have my calling. You don't have my anointing. You are not me, and God is not going to make two of me. One of me is enough. <laughs> but... Yeah, yeah, yay, yeah, woo. yeah, yeah, but the thing after, man, when I first started in ministry, I prayed and prayed, and then one day I get a phone call from my, my best friend's aunt to come to a little town in Winnemac, Winnemac, Indiana, would you come hold a meeting in my house, and I go there, and, and, and all teenagers, I mean, do you understand, I, I started out with offerings of two to five to ten dollars a week. And still, somehow, God made it for us because we trusted him. Two to five to ten, because, you know, these are kids. They know nothing about giving. Uh, the one aunt, uh, you know, I think the older woman's the one who put the ten bucks in. I don't know if any of the others did. But are you willing? Are you willing to walk it? Regardless of the circumstances. And believe God for more because he is faithful and he is true. And I love you and so does he. Matter of fact, my love for you is hatred compared to his love for you. Would you bow your heads? Bow your heads. Bow your heads before the most high God. Bow your heads to him, not because I'm asking you to. Just do it for your love for him. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, we, 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 so, we so appreciate the honesty and the sincerity of the Lord Jesus, Father, that in calling us to follow him, he's not hiding things from us of what we could experience, what we could go through, what we might have to go through to be a follower of you. But Lord, you're showing us it's worth it. It's all worth it. At the end of our lives, we haven't wasted them. At the end of our lives, we haven't spent our days and our times on stuff, Lord, that does not matter. But Lord, we come to the end of our lives and toward the end of our lives, and we reflect upon you how great and kind and loving you are to call us to yourself. You call us to come, to love and obey, to walk with you into life, and to last forever. So I pray for each one here today, Lord, 
your grace upon them, your great grace, your love for them, just being so manifest, Lord. And even as we've heard this morning by the Spirit in so many different ways, Lord, through those who have shared and those who have praised and worshiped you, the worship team, Lord, we just pray that you would just close this service this morning with your own kiss, your own kiss unto us, my God and my King. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Why don't you stand? Go ahead, Isaac. who he is hallelujah loving us and caring for us if you haven't given your heart to the lord jesus if you haven't if you've given your heart to him you've never given your life to him one thing this morning man give give your life to him give your heart to him don't turn back turn in turn toward go with god walk with him know him love him this is what God wants of us. This is what God wants of us. Hallelujah. Well, Father, I just thank you for all your precious people here this morning. I thank you for your grace over them, your love to them, your goodness to them. Lord, we bless you. We thank you. There's no God like you. One thing, one thing. In Jesus' name, bless you. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Have a great one. <laughs>